Yeah, now I'm off? No. Now I'm on. Okay. Well, good morning. <laughs> Are we good, Jackie? Awesome. All right, thank you. Welcome to worship. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful Sunday morning, a little cooler than yesterday afternoon, and hopefully we get a little bit of relief today before things crank back up this week. But I'm glad you're here. Pastors Chuck and Stephanie are still on their vacation, uh, a much-needed vacation, a well-deserved vacation, and we just hope that they found uh, much rest and renewal over the last couple weeks. I believe they'll be back this week. So in the meantime, you're stuck with me. But the good news is we have Rhonda here today. She's back. Let's give Rhonda a hand. That's a treat. That is a treat. Uh, so we're, glad, we're glad to have you sharing your talents with us today. We missed you. Um, so let us uh, begin our worship today with the words of the confession and forgiveness. And you can follow along on the screens or in your bulletin, or in the book if you want to be really old school. Are you having trouble with the screen? Are you having trouble with the screen? Oh, you should fix that. <laughs> Sorry. Well, you guys got your bulletins out? All right, well, we're gonna move forward. Jackie's going to keep working on that. All right. <laughs> Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways. To the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you. And for his sake, he forgives you all your sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. Let's join together in our gathering hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. It's found on page 559 in your green hymnal or on the screen. Yep. <laughs>
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Let's join together in our song of praise. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. The prophet calls upon Israel to do justice in the view of God's immense intervention to save. Righteousness and obedience define who belongs to the Israelite community, not race, nationality, or any other category. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners and who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants. All who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it and hold fast my convents, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in the house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. May God be merciful to us and bless us. May the light of God's face shine upon us. Light. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has brought forth its increase. God, our own God, has blessed us. 
May God give us blessing and may all the ends of the earth stand in awe. God has not rejected Israel, rather the call and gifts of God's irrevocable so that while I have been disobedient, God has mercy upon all. I ask then, has God rejected his people by then no means? I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people, whom he foreknew. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable, just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of the disobedience. So they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you, they too have now received mercy for God and has imprisoned all in disobedience so that he may be merciful to all. Let us please rise for our gospel verse. this morning comes from St. Matthew, the 15th chapter. In this gospel, Jesus teaches his disciples that true purity is a matter of the heart rather than outward religious observances. Almost immediately, this teaching is tested when a woman considered to be a religious outsider approaches him for help. Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, listen, and understand, it's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached him and said to him, Did you know that the Pharisees took offense when they heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. And if one blind person guides another, they both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. Then he said, are you still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and that is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place, and they went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away. She keeps shouting after us. And he answered her, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise you, you may be seated. I had a couple of props here. I gotta get a little closer. Oh, ladder. You just wait. You just wait. You might regret saying that. <laughs> so, um, I have something here, Leonard, for you. For you. <laughs> 20 bucks. <laughs> 20 bucks. 
What do I have to do? You know what? Um, Rich is looking kind of sad over here. You should can I? Back. Can I? Can I have? Let me just let me have a couple of these back. Okay. <laughs> oh, Leonard. <laughs> Bill, Bill's looking a little sad. Can I have? Rich, Rich, Max, Max, he did such a good job. <laughs> oh. But Doreen is looking really, you got, hey, hey, you got, you got change? <laughs> you keep it. We'll come back to that later. Today we're going to talk a little bit about economics. I just lost about a third of you, I think. <laughs> no, I promise you there'll be no math. No math. Economics, actually, a lot of people think economics is a math discipline. It's not. Economics is actually a behavioral science, right? It's a study of human behavior, and in particular, how humans behave around resources, how we use them, how we share them, particularly resources that are limited. Okay? So when we think economics and we think limited resources, the first thing that comes to our mind is money, right? Economics, money. But that's not the only resource that we have that we interact with that's limited. Time is a limited resource, right? There's only so many hours in a day. Energy is a limited resource, right? Physical energy, mental energy, there's only so much our bodies and our minds could take before we need a break. And kind of along those lines, our capacity for stress is a limited resource. Space is a limited resource. We just moved Luke into his dorm. <laughs> Space. <laughs> You've all had that closet door that doesn't want to shut, right? We interact with limited resources all the time. And early on in our life, one of the things that we learn is one of the biggest mistakes that we can make is to treat limited resources as if they are unlimited. You ever done that? Right? Maybe you blow through your paycheck and then you can't pay your mortgage. Consequences, right? It's never pretty. Not going to be a fun conversation with the banker at best. You ever blown through a couple hours on social media and missed an appointment or a deadline. Maybe you've treated your body and your mind as if it's had no limits and you've just taken on way more than you can handle and it leads to illness and injury. And if we treat space like there are no limits, you end up on a reality TV show. See, some, all of life is really about negotiating all of these limited resources that we have around us. And to, to, to manage that into a lifestyle that is hopefully comfortable and meaningful. So when I, the word economics came in here, some of you probably thought, I don't know anything about economics. I, I beg to differ. You know a lot about economics. You live it every day. And there's a couple of economic principles that are really, that we're really familiar with. So first of all, the first one is cost, okay? This idea of cost. Limited resources are limited. They're one-shot wonders. You get to use them once, right? So if you choose to use one of your limited resources, whether it's your money or your time or your energy, if you choose to use it one way, you automatically, at that time, it becomes unavailable for every other possible way that you could have used it. If I go up and spend 20 bucks at Dorothy's, that's 20 bucks that I can't spend at Hoyt's. There's a win-lose component when we have limited resources, just like we saw in our demonstration. To share that 20 bucks with Rich cost Leonard 10 bucks. <laughs> and to share that with Bill cost him another five. 
and sharing with Max cost Rich five bucks. They lost. Max won. That's how limited resources work. And we know that. The second principle of economics that we kind of live out every day is this idea that because they're limited, we have to protect them, right? We have to save them, we have to hoard them, maybe, perhaps, manage them. And the best way to protect these limited resources is to eliminate the competition, right? So I have five bucks to spend on some candy. Now, if I buy this, Reese's. Anybody here like Reese's? Raise your hand if you like Reese's. Nobody likes Reese's. Oh, nope, oh, Jack. My family likes Reese's. So if I buy this candy, there's third what's there's like 30 pieces in there, okay? If I buy this and I bring this home, I am not gonna get 30 pieces of candy. I'm going to get a couple, because everybody else is going to have some too, right? If I use my resources, there's competition. This is not what I'm going to say. Oh, pass this around. Take a resource. Now, on the other hand, if I use my five bucks and I buy this, this is dark chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody in my family likes dark chocolate. If I buy this, I get the whole package. <laughs> okay. This is protecting my resource. If my goal is to protect my chocolate, I am going to use, I'm going to buy this. I'm going to protect my resource. I'm going to save it. Make sure Vicky gets it. <laughs> And the third kind of thing, economic principle, that becomes really important when we're dealing with limited resources is this idea of worth. If we're going to expend a resource on something and make it unavailable to everything else, it better be good. It better be worthy. It better be worthwhile. So this notion of good enough is an economic principle. And we live this out every day. Things have to be good enough. So this is all fine and dandy, but what does this have to do with our text this morning? What does this have to do with the church? A lot, really. Because believe it or not, sometimes we think about God. We think about his grace, his mercy, his love, his gifts as a limited resource. And we apply these economic principles. And it impacts our relationship. And this is, we're not alone. We're in good company. Because you know who else was doing it? The Pharisees, in the time of Jesus. Because in their own mindset, yeah, there was a time in our religious history where God's love, God's grace, God's mercy was limited. It was limited to just the people of Israel. And within that covenant, it was very limited by the law. And so, you know, it's not really a stretch. And the, the Israelites had been through just tremendous, tremendous stuff. They had been, you know, they had, they, as a kingdom, they were under David, things were great. And then it divided and things got really messy to the point where their nation was defeated. They were in exile. Now they're back. They've, they've rebuilt the temple. And, you know, they're, they're getting back to it. But they've never been fully restored to their social and political power that they used to be. And so these Pharisees are just hanging on to their religion with everything they've got. They've seen the scarcity of God's love and God's grace and God's mercy at times. But God never meant his people for it to be limited permanently. That was never the plan. For a while it was. For a while the people of Israel were the people of God. How do we know this? We know this because he tells us through the prophets. And our text from Isaiah this morning tells us exactly that, right? 
It tells us that God reveals a bigger plan. Let me see, Max read it to us, and it was so really cool. It said, he says, the Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those who are already gathered. We know that God is going to expand the kingdom. And so then we fast forward into um, the time of our gospel, the time of our reading this morning, and I tell you what, God's covenant is still largely considered a very limited thing. And I tell you what, those Pharisees, those church leaders, those teachers, those rabbis, man, they, were, they were doing everything they could. Those economic principles were in fine form. They were very cognizant of the fact that sharing their faith was a cost. They were very cognizant, and they were hell-bent on protecting their religion. And they were quick to judge who was good enough and who wasn't, because they were clinging to everything that they knew. And they did it through the law. They used the law as a weapon, especially some of the nitpicky laws about food and cleanliness, hand-washing, and all those things. See, the law was given to the people when they came out of slavery to teach them how to interact with each other, how to live together, and how to be presentable and live to God. The law was originally intended to draw people together into God, but the Pharisees were using the law to push people away. They knew the law, and they knew it well. If they were highway patrol and the speed limit's 55, they're pulling you over for going 55 and a quarter. These guys got it. They're, but they're pushing people away. They're using the law as their dark chocolate. And so Jesus comes on the scene. He's ready. He's ready to usher in this new covenant. And so one of the first things he does, we've, we've kind of been seeing him do that all summer, actually. A few weeks ago, we heard him talk about the kingdom of heaven. We heard him talk about it as a mustard seed that's going to grow. We heard him talk about it as a yeast bread that's going to rise. We heard him about him feeding 5,000 plus people with two loaves and two fishes. Last week, we saw him walking on the water, and Peter too, at least for a little while. We've seen him busting away these limits. We've seen him trying to expand their thinking. And today, he's out speaking, and he says, he takes a shot at these leaders, and he says this real quick comment. It's not what goes in that defiles, but what comes out. He doesn't necessarily say it directly to him, but the disciples come back. You know they were offended by this Jesus, right? He's like, yeah, I know. But don't worry about it. It'll work itself out. See, they don't know they don't know. God, God's going to take care of it. Eventually, their limited thinking is going to get them stuck. Let it play itself out. Don't worry about it. So then Peter, God bless him. you got to say, Peter's like, Okay, well, can you at least tell us what this means? Because we don't want to fall into that pit, right? Help me figure this out, Jesus. And, and he goes on to kind of explain it to them about what goes out. And I, I think this is really cool because he uses, um, let me see, I want to look at that. What does he say to them? It's not, i find it. It's not, it's what proceeds, proceeds from the heart. Out of the heart come. Evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. What do these things sound like? Do they sound familiar? They sound kind of like the Ten Commandments, right? Yeah, Jesus is telling these guys to get back to the basics, get back to the original law. Don't get lost in the weeds. Focus on the things that draw people together and to God. And then... We have this interchange with the Canaanite woman, and oh my gosh, I think this is hands down probably one of the most powerful interchanges in the gospel. It really is. So, and we see Jesus maybe a little bit out of character, but I gotta believe that Jesus is seeing this whole thing unfold as a teachable moment. Have you guys, as a parent, as parents, can you, can you? Imagine this. You probably watched your kids. You probably saw this. You saw something happening and you saw, oh, this isn't going to end well, but you just kind of stepped back and let it play out because you wanted to be there to catch them and teach them something. I got to believe that's what Jesus is doing here. Because this woman approaches him. 
He knows she's a foreigner. She knows she's a foreigner. She knows she's not good enough. But she approaches him anyway. And so the first thing he does is ignore her. He wants to see what are the disciples going to do. Are they paying attention? Did they just get what I put down? Did they just get what I'm telling them about drawing people to God? And of course, they don't. The disciples are back in that old limited economic mindset. She's not a Jew. She's not good enough. We don't share. We have to protect you, Jesus. You're ours. And so they come to Jesus, send her away. She's driving us nuts. And, and so I, I see Jesus, you know, you know, instead of like just jumping after these guys and rebuke him, you just kind of see and get this grin, like, all right, I'm going to let this play out. Right? And so he steps into that role, that role that the disciples have put him in. And he says, what does he say? He says, I'm here for the lost children of Israel. It's not fair to throw the children's food to the dogs. It's quite a metaphor. And the disciples are like, yeah, Jesus, you tell her. And this woman's reaction, it's just, I mean, it is golden. It is golden. First thing she says, yes, Lord. She doesn't argue. And she stays with him in the metaphor, and she says, but even the dogs get the crumbs from the master's table. And if you just see Jesus start to grin, right? See, in essence, what Jesus was saying by the pressure of the disciples, is he was saying, my power is limited. If I give it to you, it's going to get taken away from somebody else. And that's not okay. But her response is, no, 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 Jesus. I don't want to take anything away from anybody else. And I don't think that's how you work. I think they can have your full love, your full grace, your full gifts, your full mercy, and I think there's still some from me. See, in essence, Jesus is telling this woman, you're not good enough. And her response is, I know. But do I have to be? You can just see Jesus. Just close your eyes and imagine. Imagine those shoulders drop. Imagine that grin come on his face. Imagine that. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. She gets it. She gets it. She gets that he's here to change this paradigm. This Canaanite woman shows up, the disciples who've been following Jesus all along. In this one sentence, in this one interchange, she blows open this whole new truth about who Jesus is. See, God's love, God's grace, God's mercy are not a limited resource. Economic principles do not apply. There is no cost to being loved by God. If your guilt and your shame is kind of hanging on and you're thinking, oh, there's, uh, God, there's somebody else that's better than me that, that should get loved by him first, don't. It's not how we work. We don't have to protect God. We don't have to save him. We don't have to protect him from sinners. He's got it. He knows what to do with them. We don't have to eliminate competition. We don't have to push people away. There's plenty. There's no such thing as good enough when it comes to if you're asking that question, God, am I good enough for you? That's the wrong question. The question is, do I have to be? And the answer to that is no. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, that question is irrelevant. And this truth was reiterated really, really beautifully by Paul in our New Testament lesson this morning. He's writing to the church in Rome. This is the early church. So there's some Jews and there's some Gentiles. And so, and they ask, eventually that economic thinking kind of kicks back in. And they ask this question, okay, now that God's love, now that Jesus is for the Gentiles too, now that everyone's included, what does that mean for the Jews? Did God reject them? It's that win-lose kind of thinking again, right? It's that limited idea. Did the Gentiles win and the Jews lose? 
And Paul's words, Paul's answer is unequivocally no. Let me reread that because this is so beautiful what he says. The gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Irrevocable. You can't be taken away. There are no winners and there are no losers. Leonard. Yeah. Here's your money back. Do, do something kind with it. Rich, here's your full measure. Max, here's your full measure. Do something kind. Bill, here's your full measure. Do something kind. That is how God's love works. Money doesn't grow on trees. Your mom was right. But God's love, God's grace, God's mercy does. It grows on that tree up there that we call the cross. And it is abundant. It is unlimited. And that, my friends, is really, really good. Thanks be to God. Let us celebrate that good news with, I believe we have a hymn. Rhonda, what do we got? My faith looks up to thee. It'll be verses 1 through 3. That's number 479 in the Green Book, if you are following that. <coughs> Right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. 
pray. God of field and forest, see and sky, you are the giver of all good things. Sustain us with these gifts of your creation and multiply your graciousness in us, that the world may be fed with your love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us join together in prayers of the church. Confident that God receives our joys and our concerns, let us offer our prayers for the church, for those in need, and for all of creation. O God, your spirit gathers the church. Shepherd those who are newly baptized and newly ordained in the proclamation of the gospel. Breathe life into ecumenical and interreligious endeavors and support missionaries throughout the globe. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You created the earth and all its inhabitants and declared it good. Clean, polluted skies, seas, and soil provide nourishment to plants and animals and make us aware of our impact on the environment. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. You call leaders to bridge differences and practice generosity. Inspire all in authority to protect people in harm's way. Deliver those in bondage. Support fair elections. Provide care for military personnel and veterans and show mercy to those for whom they have responsibility. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. God, you provide for those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Embrace people who have been rejected because of difference. Heal trauma caused by racism <clears throat> or prejudice. Shield away any who are persecuted. Console the dying and heal the sick. We pray especially this morning for Janice and Faye and Darla Karen, Alan, Gary, Megan, for Sharon, Helen, Lorelai, Ricky, Dawn, Judy, Rory, Ann. We pray for Erica, for Roger and Linda and Cheryl. We pray for the families of Arlen Engler and Alice Tribish and James Troyer. We also pray for Ricky and Mary and Brad and Misty and Marcy and Harlan. Brianna, Thea, Algernon, Sue, and Alicia. Hear us, O oh God. O oh God, you journey with us all in life's transition. Guide those preparing for baptism, marriage, and retirement. Guide our church councils and committees in their vision and ministry. We pray especially this morning for Pastors Chuck and Stephanie that their vacation. Uh, offered rest and renewal, that they return safely and ready to continue their most important work. Renew others on vacation as well and safeguard those who travel. Hear us, O oh God. We give you thanks for those who rest from their labors. Motivate us by their lives and dedication to the gospel until the day when we join them in our eternal home. Hear us, O oh God. We pray with joy this morning for new life for Coy Michael Lindemann. Be with him and his parents as they transition. Hear us, O oh God. Into your hands, O oh God, we commend all for whom we pray in the name of the one who reconciled all creation to himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let us join together and pray. As Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You may be seated. All right, let's talk about what's happening this week. First of all, tomorrow, newsletter articles are due, so please get those to bed in the office. That's just crazy that August is this far in. Uh, our calendar for this week, on Wednesday, we have Bible study here at English, and it will be live streamed. Um, our here. Are pastors back? This is going to be an in-person thing? 
I'm not sure if they're back on Wednesday or not, but there will be Bible study. It says it's at English, so I'm thinking they're going to be here. Uh, Bible study at Country Views at 1 o'clock. And then on Wednesday evening, the Trinity, the ladies of Trinity and Grace in Westbrook have invited um, all of our ladies from our congregations to their salad supper on Wednesday, and they have a speaker coming up. So if you're free Wednesday night, that'd be a great opportunity for fellowship. Next Sunday, our worship is going to be out at the vineyard, out at Painted Prairie. Um, so last year, that was a really beautiful service, and, and I expect no less this year. So hopefully you can join us out there. Um, at, that will be at 9 a.m. Um, let's see. Next Saturday, um, there is going to be um, a memorial for uh, James, the life of James Troyer um, in Dovery. Um, so Mary Alice and her family invite you to stop in for a time to visit and reminisce the life of Jim. So that is coming up next uh, Saturday. Um, anything else that needs to be mentioned? All right, well, then let's move forward with the blessing. The Almighty God and Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit bless you all now and forever. All right, I believe we have a sending song. Rise, shine, you people. It's number 393 if you're using the book. And I believe there's coffee. There's coffee, so stick around for treats and fellowship.